কারণ তুমি 64 বিট যেটা দেওয়া যেটা পেন ড্রাইভে ওটা দিয়ে আমি যা করা করেছি আমি কিন্তু আলাদা করে কিছু করিনি সুন্দর কি বল হ্যালো Hi, Professor Balaram. Oh, this hi. is <laughs> How are you? Yeah, how are you? I have <laughs> given the task to introduce you. <laughs> so, very difficult where, job. Where, where are you? In the... I'm at the Indian Institute of Chemical Biology now. No, you're still in the lab? Yeah, still in the lab. Still in the lab <laughs> as an emeritus. So, how are things with you? You are still uh, associated with the lab or? Just, uh... hey, I, I... I was going to NCBS, but after the virus came along, there are more risks. Oh, okay, okay. So you have a, you have a lab at NCBS? Uh, a lab, but I go there and 
have some people work one or two people working with me oh okay. work in somebody else right so uh they have given me this kind of difficult job to introduce you <laughs> so what is the situation covid situation in bangalore i don't know i mean it's been uh, things seem to have gone back to normal i mean the roads are crowded <laughs> right right in calcutta also people are on the street i think the only difference is that many people wear masks so uh, right yeah that one thing that uh, uh, important thing they are doing at least but uh, but still in 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 especially kids they don't really care much so that's no, the here also kids are all playing and i mean those who are playing are playing they're not wearing mask and playing. right right so they don't care much at all did they okay. i don't know i think it's uh, so uh, so in between i thought uh, i i'll talk about little bit of because you are you have free time i have i have one question that the this spike protein is heavily glycosylated hmm. and the the patient that is producing antibodies to glycosylated protein hmm. and uh, and uh, as a peptide how much cross reactivity you would expect between the when the immune response is directed towards glycosylated peptide uh in covid uh, spike protein and as a peptide as a synthesized peptide in the laboratory how much they would expect you would expect that should cross react if it is glycosylated and you are raising an antibody to the peptide i would suspect it won't cross react very much at all okay uh, on the other hand if you not sequence of the protein will not be glycosylated right so uh and also there will be peptides to which uh, eventually you're producing uh, t cell uh, mediated yes. response yeah so those presented peptides probably if you raise antibodies you would get yeah so things are getting really complicated to understand immunologically because um, the t cell picture in some papers they are talking about cd8 population is playing a very important role initially started with the antibody response that antibody playing very important yes. all yes. the plasma therapy uh, kind of now icmr is not uh, so now plasma therapy seems to have gone into disfavor yeah probably <laughs> not, uh, it's not working so it's not really came in the big no, whether it's not working or uh, it work only with some patients and not with uh, no. always i i i think that uh, because the patient may produce antibodies but one will have to look for which can prevent this kind of interaction because then you have to test all this uh, yeah lots of antibodies may not be useful yeah. antibodies yeah. So you have to all we don't know from a sera from each individual to be tested in a vero cell system that it inhibits the vero cell infection with the virus and if if it has that ability probably those serum to be tested as a as a kind of uh, uh, but if you take uh, this coronavirus is not terribly different from the sars cov 1 yeah that's true i guess from 2003 to 2019 mm-hmm. studies have been going on uh, uh on the other virus right i think they must have a lot of information regarding uh, i i i read your uh, article on the how the covid uh, how the sars virus was discovered <laughs> because in some of the impression i used to carry that amelia that's the scottish uh, oh the lady who took the electron micrograph micrograph i thought actually she took only the electron micrograph okay so she I, was an electron microscopist right she right. wasn't a virologist in that
how is it are you able to go to iicb some day so it was it was basically a kind of a very restricted uh, way of going there but mm-hmm. now it's kind of open very uh, recently it has opened to all the scientists now so everybody is going now there is a huge restriction for the students so now students have also joined how in uh, ncbs and iisc also the, the same yeah. thing i think but still it's not the norm the way it works mm-hmm. right but i i was kind of uh, reading on paper in science or nature because in netherland they had some from the blood bank they collected uh, all the t cells pre covid situation and uh, they found that great deal of cross reactivity with the uh, covid 19 virus but all those blood was collected from in a blood bank in a pre pre covid days so it's la- it seems that the other sars virus uh, do have some cross reactive uh, no, i think all the coronaviruses we've been getting coronavirus infections for a long time for a long time yeah many of our colds might have been due to coronavirus right. uh, infection right i think this is one reason why so many people have uh, been quite uh, protected in many ways right 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 so and they've been sort of asymptomatic in uh, right and also another hypothesis is that uh, the our our innate immune arm is probably fairly strong because we are exposed to almost so probably that also contributes from the idea of protection yeah i suspect uh, oh anybody i sent the link to i sent it to a friend so he has my name on it <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how the zoom works but <laughs> so one one attempt icmr is taking for the bcg bcg vaccination mm-hmm. that's a kind of uh, non specific uh, stimulus for the innate arm of the immune system so probably they think that that bcg vac- bcg vaccination uh, can offer protection so it's maybe true i don't know but uh, but it basically stimulates macrophages that is just a general kind of Yeah, it's a kind of non-specific, generalized uh, stimulation of the innate arm of the immune system. I think by the time everything is figured out, the virus would have slowly subsided. Right, right, right. It will, it will, it will One minute, please. Like this. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, because I sent you the link, you have my name against you. <laughs> so how how do I erase it? I don't. You can. I don't know. I have no idea how this works. <laughs> because somebody else may mistake what is happening to Balrams. <laughs> <laughs> you, if you, but anyway, if you switch off your videos and I don't switch it off, then they'll. Uh, but I am oh. the only one with the slides available. <laughs> okay. Also. Try to switch off the video. How are you? I am fine. Come on. Well, you have a huge number of books behind you. Oh yeah. During, uh, during my stay, when I was a postdoc at MIT with Malcolm Gibbs group, because uh, in Harvard Square area, where you probably use oh, yes. a good deal of your time. A lot of cheap books also. Cheap bookstores. 
So I used to go to old bookstores and used to purchase things. Uh, so, and also that time, the CD was just coming. Mm -hmm. So a lot of old uh, album shops also there. Mm -hmm. So I was a kind of fond of, very much fond of operas. So I used to go to opera house in Boston. So I, I purchased a lot of opera albums. So still I play all those albums once in a while because <laughs> I, I love it. So I'm still fascinated with those, all those albums, a huge thing. So it's, it's difficult nowadays because you don't get... Uh, uh, the, the... Uh, sir. Sir, good evening. Uh, good evening. Hi. Good evening, sir. Good this evening. is Master Sir. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you for taking, uh, accepting our invitation. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Bhattacharya. How are you? I'm okay, sir. Fine. How are you, sir? <laughs> oh, my God. You have so many books behind you. The background is wonderful. That's what I was telling him. <laughs> my uh, collection during my Boston days. Oh, it's a huge lot of books. I haven't listened to you, but I have listened to Dr. Padmanavan Balaram <laughs> in YouTube. Yeah, he... He his, his when he talks his his kind of it's a kind of symphony you can really yeah yeah I absolutely agree to it pattern and uh, you will be adhered to it probably you cannot really dissociate yourself uh, from when he's giving us giving a talk so that's uh, true sir will be adhered to it sir any advice for us those who want to follow your kind of um, oratory skill. <laughs> I know my age has already crossed by. I do not know if I practice. Can I make a little bit of? No, I think practice is the most important, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yes, some people can do it. That's how that gift of gab, the profile has come. So how are you spending your retired life? Are you going regular to ISI? Oh, no, I, I'm going not to IIS, but to NCBS, another institute here in Bangalore. And, uh, so it's uh, also biological sciences. All the institutes are filled up with your students. Uh, no, not really, but uh, I have lots of friends. <laughs> your students' community must be very big, direct and indirect. But actually, I find that Post-COVID, I have become even more busy because of this online thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking to send this link to Arindam, but I, I don't have his email ID. So I thought I will send it to Arindam uh, so that he can listen to it. Let me check if I can collect Arindam's. I have been given thanks by one Dr. Ritu Parna. I didn't know her. She sent a mail to yeah, me. Yeah, she's an old student of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Three, four such mails have come to me. The interesting thing with the online thing is you can do something in the morning in Trivandrum and something in Kolkata later in the day, which you could never do in person. Right, right. Another two minutes left. Sir, are you moving now from the home to the institutes or absolutely been confined in the... No, I am largely at home only uh, now. Yeah. Partly because... I have someone to look after at home and my wife has to go to work. Achha, achha. Once in a while I go. Not okay, I, I thought it's for COVID. No, I've already got COVID. Oh, you've already had? I've already had. I spent 10 days in hospital, oh, 14 God. days. In, I've done all that. So, you... <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, in fact, I was interested when Shaman asked me, if so, maybe if you have long-term immunity, it would be comforting. 
yeah yeah so you, I, you had any respiratory distress or just uh, just i didn't have respiratory distress i had the other things fever and all those things i had a lot of post covid symptoms which my wife and others do acha acha no we are nowadays finding lot of patients with post covid problems like my post covid problems were worse than my covid problems <laughs> Sir, won't it be like booster effect if you go and uh, mingle a little um, with people and get COVID reinfection? Hmm. At least in the next two three months, when your immunity is likely to be active. I was just wondering, having COVID is one way good because once you have COVID, you know you have some immunity, or you test hmm. your antibodies, it's positive. Then you do your normal activities, get exposed, hmm. and won't it be like a booster effect if you are in? contact with the covid patient no the, the the covid does not really reflect the conventional wisdom of immunology because there are so mm. aberrant aberrant issues that they are in china there are patients recovered but without any antibody titer so probably t cells are playing a very important role so it's a kind of lot of uh, issues and really uh, all the entire immunological dogma is a kind of little questionable now that uh, how we are how protection is coming from uh, covid infection whether you would like t cell immunity isn't it t cell whether the uh, cd8 population or cd4 population or gamma delta t cells so so many issues are there those not been addressed yet probably we do not know from where this uh, uh, protection is coming and that again always i feel that uh, that the the vaccine thing that since we have an hla polymorphism so how many of them is going to respond to this vaccine so this question very often comes to my mind that and also another issue that immunologists always deal with that the concept of the super antigens whether virus do have any super antigens that directly activate t cells and induces the cytokine storm and that is the responsible for all kinds of problems the cytokine storm you know which chemical problem so this the super antigeny thing uh, there is a paper in pns i i was kind of uh, kind of happy to see that probably there are some super antigens in the virus and that can directly activate t cells uh, to induce the cytokine storm so issue is sir uh, sorry to in yes uh, sir, sorry to interrupt you i think uh, it's already 631 and we should uh, Let's yeah. start with the session as of now. Okay, please. Can I share my screen? So uh, just wait for a minute. I will give a brief introduction. Post which you can share your screen. Okay. Good evening. I welcome you all on behalf of our institute, the Institute of Pulmonary Care and Research, Kolkata. We cordially invite you to attend our today's session of Pulmonary 2020. This is a short tribute to of the great scientist Dr S N De and in memorial of him we are uh, presenting this session to you to talk about today's session we have our eminent speaker and chairperson with us and now i would like to take the opportunity to introduce our organizing secretary and i would request Dr Partho Sharathi Bhattacharya to kindly proceed over the session by introducing our eminent chairperson for today's session over to you sir it fills my heart with joy and uh, pride to welcome you all to our palmocon today um, especially for this session which we started 12 years back and uh, uh, i will not delay you and will not stand between you and professor balram i will introduce uh, uh, professor samuel roy who is a jc bose fellow department of science and technology and is an emeritus scientist of the indian institute of chemical biology kolkata over to you sir to introduce professor balram for our today's oration and uh, regarding this oration i have got nothing much to say it has been uh, um, uh, graced by a lot of luminaries so far and we are very happy and always feel privileged that dr balram has agreed to give this oration thank you sir. okay can you hear me hello yeah. yes okay so <clears throat> so i have been uh, assigned by the organizers a very difficult task that is to introduce professor p balram i know one thing that i do not qualify for this difficult job however i have to do so 
as a custom. Uh, Professor Balaram does not need any introduction in Indian science. So contribution extraordinary. So I have the great pleasure and privilege to introduce Professor Balaram. Professor Balaram graduated in chemistry from Pune University. And then he joined uh, Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur for his master's degree. And then subsequently did his PhD from the Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And then underwent a short postdoctoral training at the Department of Chemistry at Harvard University, Cambridge, USA. Professor Balaram is known nationally and internationally. And uh, for his work on the structure, conformation, and biological activity of number of uh, designed as well as natural peptides, Professor Balaram applied variety of techniques to decipher the factors influencing the folding and the conformation of the, of the peptides. And his group has investigated the complex rules by which peptide sequences play a role in the formation of the secondary structure. He is the recipient of Shanti Choru Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology in 1986, GD Birla Award for Science Research, Tuas Prize and Paddha Sri and Paddha Bhushan he has served as the director of Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore from 2005 to 2014 and was the editor of the journal Current Science from January 1995 to June uh, 2013. In an interview with magazine uh, Resonance with Professor uh, Shottamurti, Professor Shottamurti asked Professor Balaram, how did you really took this path? Professor Balaram replied, quote, looking back, it is very difficult to say how one took a particular path. In my own case, I had no intention really of doing research and would have probably happily sat for civil service examination if I had not gone and studied at IIT Kanpur. It was there I first experienced the thrill of working in the lab and it was a sort of inevitable then that one drifted into research. From my personal side, I have had numerous interaction with him, especially during the meetings of the funding agencies. And also during his tenure as the chairman of the research council of the Indian Institute of Chemical Biology. He was always encouraged young people. Once I was in CSI lab at Srinagar and Professor Balaram also in that meeting. And uh, on our way return uh, at the Srinagar airport, security was extremely tight and Professor Balaram somehow managed to carry a nature issue with him to read, read during, his, during the journey from Srinagar to Delhi. So, Professor Balaram published more than 400 papers to his credit. And to be honest, that Professor Balaram actually discovered SND and a special issue of current issue was dedicated to honor this gifted scientist SND. I'm happy that Palmokol organized such a meeting for paying tribute to the legendary Indian scientist SND. Now let us hear from uh, the rest of the story from Professor Balaram. With this brief introduction, I invite Professor Balaram to give the 12th SND oration. With this, I invite Professor Balaram. Uh, may I share my screen now? Internet connection there. Yes, sir, you can share your screen now. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? No, not yet. Can you see it now? No. No. Uh, it has come. Oh, now, now it is there. It's come? Yeah. Okay, I'll make it full screen. Tell me if it has come full screen for you. Yeah, it has come full screen now. Okay. Mm. 
Uh, good evening. You know, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Parthasati Bhattacharya for inviting me to this meeting organized by Palmakon Kolkata, and also to Professor Shamal Roy for his introduction. When I received Dr. Bhattacharya's email and saw that I was being asked to deliver an SN Day memorial oration, my first reaction was that I am not a researcher, I'm not working in pathology, I'm not a cholera researcher, and uh, I might actually be an inappropriate person to talk in a memorial oration for Professor S. N. Day. What I'm going to do this evening is really to tell you a story. This will not be, there will not be hard science in this lecture, but I'm really going to tell you how did I discover SN Day? Or you might ask, how did a scientist, ignorant of cholera research, discover Shambhunath Day? But I want to say a word about cholera because we now hear the word pandemic all the time because of the coronavirus. The first major global cholera pandemic has its origins in Bengal. And you can trace it back to the year 1817. Three years between 1817 to 1819, there is a report which is now available in the library of the National Library of Medicine. And you can have the entire report and you can see how cholera was in fact a major problem emanating from Bengal and then spreading to the other parts of the globe in those days. Now, cholera research itself, one might ask, what are the major steps, the major landmarks in cholera research? If you look at the literature, and here is an article which discusses the greatest step towards the discovery of Biblio cholerae, one of the persons talked about in this article, the first person, is John Snow. John Snow, of course, is the Englishman who actually removed the handle of the Broad Street pump and thereby made the connection between contaminated water and cholera. Snow is given a great deal of credit in the history of cholera, but there are many people who now argue that much of what Snow did had also been done by other people and that Snow's own contributions are somewhat limited. I will give you a reference to but the mode of communication of cholera is what Snow discussed originally in the mid-1850s. Around about the same time, the Italian Filippo Pacini actually found at the University of Florence, he had in fact seen the cholera bacterium under the microscope. Pacini doesn't get much credit. The credit really goes to Robert Fogg, who came to Calcutta. He came to Alexandria in Egypt in 1883-84 because there had been an outbreak of cholera at that time. And then since that outbreak, outbreak had died down, he came to Calcutta. And it's in Calcutta that he then found the bacillus, which he called the Palmer bacillus. I'm going to draw your attention to an article which appeared not too long ago in the International Journal of Epidemiology, which says, nobody loves a critic, Edmund Parks and John Snow's cholera. Anyone who's interested in the history of cholera should read it. And anyone who's interested in epidemiology should also read it, because Snow is given a great deal of credit. But the author of this commentary says many things which tell you how science really works and how science worked even 150, 170 years ago. But I'm going to read you some sentences from this article. What Tom Cock, the author of this article says is, following the first global pandemic which began in India in 1817, a generation of researchers assembled and reviewed a mass of evidence. Then he says, this review of the 19th century debate over cholera has more than historical significance. In a time of rapidly evolving epidemic zoonotics, 
the lessons of that earlier debate are as contemporary as the evolving state of the mutating coronavirus that so concerns us today. But what the author is talking about is not the coronavirus of today. He's talking about the coronavirus of 2003-04, which caused the first SARS epidemic. But that died down. Ten years later, he's written this article and he draws attention to the coronavirus. So I thought it would be quite interesting in the context of today's debates on the current coronavirus pandemic. On the middle of my slide, I've simply put the many images that you can find on the internet today of the current coronavirus. If you go back to the history of cholera and look at John Snow's paper, what he draws is he draws a map of all the places in a limited area of London the cholera cases have surfaced. And this map apparently has been used then to find out the origin of the water contamination. And that is traced to the Broad Street pump. But in many articles that have discussed this subsequently, it's turned out that this kind of mapping was not really done by Snow, but by a lot of other people. So I draw your attention to a book which has appeared called Cartographies of Disease. Maps, Mapping, and Medicine. And this is a book that I think we ought to get and read. I read only a review of this book in the American Journal of Public Health, entitled Disease Maps, History, and More. It's very important because everybody today looks at the map that I show you on this slide, the Johns Hopkins map of the current coronavirus pandemic. People are looking at it every day. And this is where all the data is. So if one is looking at disease epidemiology, Cholera has a lot of lessons to teach us even today. But, you know, this is only an introduction. I'm now going to digress. I'm going to tell you how I found SND. What I'm going to talk about is scientometrics, and this is essentially a digression. I have put two cartoons on my slide just to make the slide a little colorful. But digressions are very important sometimes when we are discussing a topic which is somewhat strange. I'll begin my digression into scientometrics by showing you my favorite quote from Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass and many other things, under his real name, Charles Dodson, once wrote this. He said the proper definition of a man is an animal that writes letters. Because in the 19th century and for much of the 20th century, we wrote letters to one another. Uh, it's only in the latter part of the 20th century, maybe in the last decade or so, that we began to write emails. And now, of course, in the 21st century, everything is only on social media. There are Twitter posts or there are posts on Facebook. I like to paraphrase Carroll's definition of man to say that scientists are animals who like to write papers. So scientists do research, and then they write up their results in the form of a paper. And what this has led to in the literature is what nature very wonderfully called a few years ago, the paper mountain. So if you take the first page of every scientific article that had been published till about 2014 and stack them up, the height would be the height of Mount Kilimanjaro, which is about 6,000 meters. Now, of course, this is a huge mass of data, and we are only looking at the first page. Now we might ask, how important are these papers? And today we judge papers and the importance of papers by the number of times they are cited by other scientists in the scientific literature. So the word citation is now commonplace. Some 30 years ago, the word citation was not so common. And that's really the beginnings of the discipline of scientometrics. And that's what I'm going to talk about. But one thing that you must see even from this slide, the vast majority of published papers are not cited even once in the scientific literature, not even by the author who wrote them. And this tells you something about why people publish papers. 
I'm going to go further away from my topic of today to tell you what has this led to, and I'm going back nearly 100 years to a paper in science in 1927. At that time, librarians had a problem. The chemistry literature was expanding, and the question was, how many journals could a college library buy with a limited budget? So what did college librarians then really do? What they did was they made this table. This is a marvelous table. It, this was an American paper. They, they took the Journal of the American Chemical Society in 1926 and asked, what were the journals which were cited in the reference lists of papers that appeared in the Journal of the American Chemical Society? These are obviously the papers which American chemists are reading. And they then made this list. Many of the abbreviations in this list would not be familiar to you. I will read some of them. Berichte, the first one on this list, is a German journal. The journal of the Chemical Society is a British journal. Annalen is a German journal. Zeitschrift for Physical Chemistry is another journal. But all these journals have now disappeared. Right at the bottom of this list, which I've marked with arrows in red, are the journals you're familiar with today. Science, Proceedings of the National Academy, and Nature, which were all relatively recent journals. In the 19th century, much of science was in Europe. Almost very little was in America. And therefore, over a period of time, this has changed. And today, when we look at the 20th century, by the time we come to the middle of the 20th century, we're really looking at a literature, scientific literature, which is heavily dominated uh, by North America. So in the mid-1950s, this problem was addressed. This was addressed by Eugene Duffy. He is, in many ways, he could be considered the founding father of the field of scientometrics. And in 1955, in Science, Garfield published this wonderful paper called Citation Indexes for Science, a new dimension in documentation through association of ideas. Think about this. What do we mean by association of ideas? When we write a paper, we quote, we cite other people's papers because we are relating our ideas to the ideas of other people. And he says this new bibliographic tool that is a citation index like others that already exist is just a starting point in literature research. It will help in many ways, but one should not expect it to solve all our problems. The Science Citation Index began as a print volume. It was long before computers became commonplace in scientific laboratories. But the idea had been born in Garfield's mind and it was outlined in this paper. The idea of the Citation Index comes from law because lawyers have for a long time had what is called the Shepherd's Index. This is an index of all the cases because in the world of law, you need precedence. You need to find out which judge has said what about a particular problem, whether it is in one country or the other in the world, so that you can cite it as a precedence. So law, in fact, preceded science in making citation indexes. And then Garfield wrote this in 1970 in Nature. 50 years ago, he said, when the science citation index was first proposed, its major objective was to break the so-called subject index barrier. Then he says something which is very, very important for what I'm going to tell you later on. Out of this bibliographic experiment has evolved a historiographic and sociometric tool of major importance. Like most other scientific discoveries, this tool can be used wisely or abused. It is now up to the scientific community to prevent the abuse of the Science Citation Index by devoting the necessary attention to its proper and judicious exploitation. Today in India and in many countries of the developing world, the Science Citation Index is exclusively abused. It is never used for any useful purpose. This is something very important for you to remember as I narrate to you the tale of how I found Chambunath Day. Garfield did wonderful analyses. 
He again did the citation frequencies and the number of papers in his index as it grew. By the middle of the first decade of the 21st century, 2006, he had this paper. By now, computers are there, databases are there. It is possible to search them. And then he said, for example, of the millions of items which are there in the Web of Science database, only about 60 papers at that time had been cited more than 10,000 times. These are the classics of the scientific literature in all fields. And you can find classics this way. And you can find the percentage of the Web of Science here is really 0%. Today, when you see something which is doing the rounds in India, about 2% of scientists uh, in the top 2% in the world, it means nothing because these numbers are actually staggering. But Garfield, as he began to develop the field of scientometrics, had this little magazine called Current Contents. I showed a picture of it on one of my earlier slides. Current Contents had the title page of every journal. So if you didn't get journals in your library, you went to the library and looked at current contents and you noted down which papers were important. At the back of current contents, the addresses of the authors were there and you could write a reprint request to them. From about 1974 till almost the year 2000, I used to look at current content quite regularly. And in the early years of the 70s and 80s, it was my favorite reading material. It used to appear in the library of the Indian Institute of Science every Thursday. And there were many professors who would want to go and pick it up because you would have to take it from behind the circulation desk and sign a register. I used to be one of the first to get hold of current contents, but what I used to read really were Garfield's essays. In two pages, at the beginning of every issue of current contents, he wrote something that he had learned from his developing citation in there. And in April of 1986, when current contents appeared in the library of the Indian Institute of Science, I saw this article. Two pages in which he wrote, Mapping Cholera Research and the Impact of Shambhunath Day of Calcutta. You can find that he has spelled Shambhu with an H and not as they spelt it without the H. Because at that time, it wasn't quite clearly known who Shambhunathe was and how did he even spell his name. But Garfield had discovered Shambhunathe by using his science citation index, using what is put here on the left-hand side, bottom left, as a multi-dimensional scaling map. Papers and connect them. Then there is what he calls a historiograph, which can trace how a field has developed from other papers. Fields develop really like trees. There are roots of every field, and we need to go back in time to trace the roots. And it turns out that if you map cholera research, Sambunath's day's work really forms a very important node in all the networks that Garfield was trying to build with his citation indices. I want you to note the date. This is 1986. 34 years ago. At that time, nobody in India was really interested in the word citation. Today, everybody is obsessed by the word citation. In this article, he had this wonderful picture. He had discovered two papers, Journal of Pathology and Bacteriology in 1953 and a paper in Nature in 1959. Both these papers were authored by Day. And they were being cited quite heavily in the literature. He then wanted to know who Shambhunath Day was, and he had great difficulty in finding out who he was. Because this was 1986. And in the slide that you put up right at the beginning, you had put up Day was born in 1915. He died in 1985. So he never saw this article. I'm going to come back towards the, towards the very end of my to show you some uh, correspondence of historical importance. But even in 1955-56, this was being cited, the Journal of Pathology paper. But you can see the number of citations in 1983-84. That 
means many people found this paper very important and you can find this peak in 1977-78. So what Garfield had actually discovered, he had discovered a scientist who was unknown everywhere and he had discovered that he had done important work in color. So Garfield is the true discoverer of Shambhunakate. And in his article, I only quote a little right. bit from his article, well, he says you. here, mm -hmm. uh, I would request people mm -hmm. to mute their mics, right. otherwise I get a little right. bit uh, of background. Uh, what yes, sir, he said here the was the there are some parallels. Keep for the physical uh, you know, uh, relief. Keep a Nathanga song, a wash one, not a hot one. Uh, oh. uh, what? what ah, right. Do that and also uh, keep your water and uh, salt balance. If, if the stool is uh, watery, Uh, I, I have stopped. If it is not also, you know, you, if it is a loose, uh, if it is a little semi-solid also, you will lose some fluid. I think uh, to be on the safe side, you always uh, make, uh, drink frequently water, keep sipping, you know. If, if uh, lemon water suits you, get some lemon water and sip it. That also will act as anti emetic hmm. No. Oh. What you do here in the background is a doctor prescribing yes, to sir. his patient. And I think they would have been happy. Yes, sir. absolutely. It reaches the... Uh, of course, you know, it gets uh, plateaued off. Plateaus. And also, you know, it's a very, uh, very interesting thing. The human organism or organisms adapt to these things after a while. I think uh, it becomes that. So I uh, look for that adaptation and uh, reinforce it. That is important. I am taking some drugs like that for a, a, a different purpose, my heart rhythm. They are uh, not to, to mute everyone else but you, sir. Okay. I actually switched off my mobile. Ah, I know. <laughs> you know that. Oh. Yeah, yeah, take it also. If, you, if it suppresses, take uh, a little bit. And if you think the uh, host has uh, the option to mute the profile, over it, you take a smaller dose. So, whatever I think, you take that. I am telling the person concerned to you mute, it, mute right? everyone but Dr. Palram. Ah, what person? His mobile is also booked. Yes, yes. Hmm. Uh -huh. All right. He said. People get used to it. Now that you have a, you know, energy and they describe all this fully, it's, it's very good. I think the determination for them is a good. I think you are a very determined person. But yes, I can really handle it. Mm. No, I, I have to send it. It is uh, something which materialized, you know, in the temple. And, uh, and I got it in my pocket, actually. I'll mail it tomorrow. A special mail I'll send it. Send it. Send it. Send it. it is. Take care. Uh, oh yeah, just uh, shall I continue now? I think so. It's over. Uh, if everybody would kindly mute their mics, it would be helpful. What I have on this slide is uh, the title of Garfield's article, and I've taken a little quote from it. He says here, there are some parallels between Barbara McClintock, the 1983 Nobel Prize winner in medicine, and A. McClintock is prone to seclusion and intellectual isolation, as was A. But while McClintock was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, that is in the United States, A was never elected a fellow of any Indian academy and never received any major award. And this was in the year 1986. In 1986, 
I was already 37 years old and I had, uh, had been elected to two of India's academies. And when I read this, I was absolutely shocked because nothing that I had done at that time in 19, 1986 would have remotely achieved the kind of impact that Sambunath Day's work apparently had as described in this article by Eugene Garfield. Eugene Garfield here is pictured with Joshua Lederberg. Joshua Lederberg is one of the most important biologists of the 20th century and also one of the most influential figures in science because among the many things that he did, Lederberg was one of the persons who pushed Garfield into creating the citation index started off as a genetic citation index. Lederberg was also the man who pushed the idea that artificial intelligence would be important in fields quite far away from computers. So he was pushing for artificial intelligence in chemistry. More than that, he was an elder statesman of science by this time. And he knew a great deal about infectious disease. And I suspect it was Lederberg who actually suggested to Garfield that he do a search on Champunath Day. So at this point after in 1986, after I had read the Garfield article, I was really in the position of Lakshman's common man. I was simply perplexed by what I saw around me in Indian science. Here was a man extraordinarily accomplished in his research but about whom nobody seemed to know anything. I asked around and nobody had ever heard of Shambhunath No one in Bangalore I came across uh, knew who he was. So I'm going to go into another digression at this point. Why then did I take interest in Shambhunath Day? In 1988, I began to be associated with the journal Current Science. The journal Current Science began in Bangalore in 1932. And on this slide, I show you the picture of the first editor, C.R. Narendra, and the then director of the Indian Institute of Science, Martin Foster, who produced a questionnaire which was sent to all members of the Indian Science Congress, asking them whether they felt it was important to have an interdisciplinary science journal in India. The response was uniformly positive, and so current science began in 1932. Meghna Saha started the journal Science and Culture in Calcutta around the same time. Now, this is what the first issue of current science looked like. There was an editorial right on its first page, just like nature, and that editorial was on a subject which even today might be important. It was called retrenchment and education. Discussed the importance of education as a public good and of the need for government funding for education. Interdisciplinary journals in 1932, nature was there, science was there, and current science was there. There were no other interdisciplinary journals of this kind. You can see that Narayan Rao modeled current science on nature, Richard Gregory wrote in current science, and you can see even the kind of logos that they have have a broad similarity. But like everything else in India by the mid-1980s, current science had begun to decline. And in 1988, Professor Shivraj Ramaseshan, a former director of the Indian Institute of Science, whom I have pictured on this slide, took over as its editor. And in 1988, sometime in July 1988, he came to my laboratory one day. He was by this time retired and uh, he didn't find me there. So he took a chair and sat down. And after a little while, a student of mine came and told me when I entered that there's an old man waiting for you. He was not very old at that time, but this is what she said. And uh, I found that it was our former director and I immediately went and welcomed him. And he said that he'd taken over as current science and would I help him? So I said, of course I would. And he inducted me as his assistant. And he said, look, we have a journal here. We are not getting too many papers to publish. 
We also have a very large number of papers which are stacked up in our office, which have never been refereed. And what are we supposed to do with all of them? So our first job was to produce the journal. And we decided we would then, as a special measure, produce special issues, which devoted that we would invite contributions. And we thought it would be a good idea to highlight the contributions of Indian scientists. He said, of course, you can do that. And you choose two of them. I chose two people, G. N. Ramachandran and Chambur Mathe, who was by now my hero, because I had seen the Garfield article. I was moderately familiar with the work of G. N. R. because I worked in his department, but I was ignorant about the work of Chambur Mathe. So from 1986 to 1988, I worked on producing this issue. And I show you this issue here, the July 25th issue of 1990. It is exactly 30 years since this happened. If you had asked me to give this talk 30 years ago, uh, which would have not have been possible, I would have known a great deal more about cholera then than I do now, because I had read and I had corresponded with some of the leading figures in cholera at that time. I had also come to know a few things. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Subhaya Arunachala, who was in the United States at that time on a visit, went to the National Library of Medicine. And he wrote to me from there that in the National Library of Medicine, in the Lederberg archives, there is a letter where Joshua Lederberg has nominated SN Day for the Nobel Prize. And uh, I did not know if this was true or not, and there's no way of finding out. And, what I did instead was write a letter to Lederberg saying that we're going to produce the special issue of current science and would he kindly write. I also wrote that I was told that you had nominated him for the Nobel Prize. This was presumptuous on my part because this information is confidential. When he replied, he didn't say anything about the Nobel Prize, but he said he would be glad to write about SND. I was delighted because once I had Lederberg as among my list of authors, I could now write to the other author saying that Professor Lederberg has agreed to write for this issue and would you be so kind to write an article. I corresponded with many people. I corresponded with the leading figures in cholera. I corresponded with John Craig, uh, with Van Henningen, uh, Finkelstein, then the son Van Henningen, and then Jan Holmgren. And to my surprise, every one of them agreed to write the article. I was not, I was not completely unknown to them. I was merely somebody from a journal writing to them, asking whether they would write. And then I began to receive these articles one by one. And each article was a revelation. In the years that have followed, many people have written about SN Day. There are many articles in the Indian Journal of Medical Research. Vigyan Prasar has produced any, uh, articles on him. There have been articles in Bengali. There have been articles in Canada. Very few of them actually cite this current science issue. But this is the issue from which they learned everything. Unfortunately, they do not also read the entire issue, which is now available. If you read it, you will find out a great deal more about what Sende's contemporaries thought about I was fortunate at that time to make contact with Dr. Amitabha Sen, who was at the Bose Institute, and J.K. Sarkar. Both of them wrote, they knew SND personally, and they used to work at the Bose Institute in Dr. Sen's lab, and they wrote on the life and work of SND. This was the first time that the life and work of SND uh, was actually written about. Unfortunately, both Dr. Sen and Dr. Sarkar have passed on. They're no longer with us today. I was fortunate some years later when I was on the Research Council of the Indian Institute of Chemical Biology and Amar Bhadure was its director. When I came, uh, he arranged for me to meet with Dr. Sen and Dr. Sen came to uh, IICB and that was the first time that I saw him. But this entire issue was produced without my having really seen many of the authors who have, of, 
I still have not seen them, many of the authors who have written on this issue. And this is what the issue looked like. There was the picture of the Kama Basilis on the cover. In 1990, we, it was early days and we were put for us to put pictures on the cover. This was a major departure for current science. And we had this picture of the Kama Basilis on the cover. This picture was taken by Professor S. N. Chatterjee here uh, in Calcutta and at the Saha Institute. And he was kind enough uh, to allow us to put this. I read you an excerpt from Joshua Lederberg's article. He en entitled this Regicide of Reigning Dog. Lederberg's articles are always very uh, interesting to read. He says here, the nearly coincidental discovery in the 1880s of the cholera vibrio, that is Robert Hawk on the one hand, and of diphtheria toxin on the other, was followed by decades of productive research on toxins as the mediators of pathogenicity. The truisms, toxin skill, had been translated into an experimental routine tested by intraperitoneal inoculation, which was simply inappropriate for this disease, that is cholera. Day's clinical observation led him to the bold thought that dehydration was a sufficient cause of the pathology of cholera, that the cholera toxin might kill merely by stimulating the secretion of water into the bowel. Day had seen a lot of cholera patients. He knew the rice watery stools of cholera. He then realized that this was a problem where there was largely water secretion to the bowel. This idea that toxins might act on mucous membranes is the beginning point of what one might call signal construction in modern cellular biology. We have laboratories today for cellular biology, but none of them know that some of the fundamental observations about how toxins might act on receptors and how this might lead to downstream events. And we trace back to Day's classic papers in the Journal of Pathology and Bacteriology and Nature. Lederberg went on to say that our appreciation for Day must then extend beyond the humanitarian consequences of his discovery. It is appalling to consider the millions of needless deaths that stem from the reign of toxin skill no less than those that flow from the still imperfect applications of means of rehydration. But he is also an exemplar that is day. He's an exemplar and inspiration for a boldness of challenge to the established wisdom, a style of thought that should be more aggressively taught by example as well as by precept. Today, when we say that there are no role models, day was a role model, working under the most difficult conditions, he had seen old literature where the rabbit ileal loop model was used as a means of test. He used the rabbit ileal loop in his first paper to show what Vibrios did, intact Vibrio, and in the Nature paper entitled The Enterotoxicity of Bacteria Free Culture Filtrate of Vibrio Cholerae. They had discovered cholera toxin. Not only had he discovered cholera toxin, it also probably discovered the mode of action of cholera toxin in the mucous membrane. Therefore, there must be membrane receptors for cholera toxin. This is what he really did in these two papers. But if you go back now to this issue and I show you the contents page of this issue again, I have made this exclusively for this lecture and I made it this afternoon because I found my own copy of the SN Day issue. I found that it's even inscribed to me by my editor at that time, Professor Shivraj Ramaseshan. So in a way, you have rekindled my memory of how this issue was actually produced. But I must now digress again. I digress to tell you about cytometrics. I told you a little bit about the journal Current Science and why we did the special issue on Chambudak Day. I can come back now and digress again. What was science in India in the 1950s and the 1960s? We can look back on this because we are 60, 70 years away from this period and we can really make a digression. And this would be a worthwhile digression to make. Was Day all alone? 
or were there other scientists in India who were then working at that time? So on this slide, I've simply picked some examples from the biological and biomedical sciences in India in the period 1945-1965. I think there must be at least some clinicians, some people with medical degrees who are listening to me speaking. Only yesterday's newspaper carried this report on the new Medical Commission of India, now giving directions to medical colleges to reduce the number of people teaching non-clinical subjects. If you diminish the teaching of non-clinical subjects to medical students, you are unlikely to create the biomedical researchers of the future. The lessons of the past must be learned well in order now to plan for the future. But one of the things that we are very good at in India is to never look back on the history that is important but to look back on history, which might sometimes be irrelevant. I've taken four fields from the biological and biomedical sciences, cell biology, infectious disease, therapeutics, and structural biology. Infectious disease is best illustrated by the work of Sabunate in 1953 and 1959. This is the decade of the 1960s. Cell biology is best illustrated by the work of Benke Subramaniam in Bangalore at the Indian Institute of Science, who was the first person to publish that chromosomes, the, about yeast chromosomes. Chromosomes have yeast, 1951 and 1952. I'm going to show you this. M.T. Tirumalacha, working at Hindustan Antibiotics then in Pune, Antibiotics and mycology is the father of Indian mycology and the man who put the first antibiotic into the clinic in India. But he has been forgotten. 1955 and the early 1960s. And of course, G. N. Ramachandra, who determined the structure of collagen in 1954-56, and then a few years later in 1960s, in the early 1960s and 1963, published his seminal paper on protein and polypeptide confirmation. Ramachandran is the best known of the scientists I have on this slide. But even Ramachandran received relatively little recognition in India. One of the saddest things is that even Ramachandran did not even receive the Padma Shri and the Padma with which I have been credited. And this, I think, is one of the travesties of the recognition process in India. Yeast have chromosomes, that's my title. And when I was looking at old documents in the Indian Institute of Science, I found that Joshua Lederberg had written to M.K. Subramanian asking for his reprints, because when he saw this paper in Nature in 1951, Lederberg immediately recognized its importance. This is being discussed in the earlier papers published in the Journal of the Indian Institute of Science. In 1952, Critical evidence for somatic doubling of chromosomes in a top case. Many years later, 50 years after this paper, Nature, in its little column 50 years ago, highlighted these papers. I show you a picture uh, in front of the building where I worked for many years, the Indian Institute of Science's main building, biochemistry in 1968. And I've marked with arrows the two authors, M.K. Subramaniam and his wife. Saraswati Royan, who are both pictured on this slide. Mycology and antibiotic discovery at Hindustan Antibiotics in Pune. M.J. Tirumalachar, 1914 to 1999. He was at least elected to the uh, Indian National Science Academy. M.K. Subramaniam was not even promoted to the rank of professor at the Indian Institute of Science. He retired before that. What did Tirumalachar do? He published a paper in 1955 where he found this new actinomycete. He also produced harmycin. This is the harmycin producer. And harmycin is in the clinic even today. 
one of the polyene antibiotics which is used for oral thrush. And then, of course, there's Ramachandra at Madras. In the early 1950s, when along with Gopinath Bhatta, produced from that very blurred X-ray diffraction diagram, the triple helical structure of polygen. This is contemporary with single helix of Linus Pauling for proteins, the double helix of Watson and Crick for DNA, and then the Ramachandran triple helix for collagen. And then some years later, in response to criticism of its collagen structure, he produced what is now a map which is known by his name, the Ramachandran map, and which finds its way into every biochemistry textbook when one discusses proteins. So sometimes when I've had the problem of looking at what is going on around me, what I call the problems of a perennial bystander, I've been a perennial bystander in Indian science looking at what goes on. Sometimes you can only go back to Lakshman's cartoons. Lakshman actually drew this picture of his common man now buried. He is based under the newspapers. You sometimes don't know what you're looking for. And many times we've actually buried our heads in the sand like ostriches, not even knowing the wonderful work that has gone on around us. Let me come to the end of my presentation by asking the question, can we have a retrospective on Tambunath? Eh? After all, you have an oration in his name. This is the 12th oration which is being held to honor his memory. Where would we place him in the history of cholera? I began this talk by showing you three pictures, John Snow, Filippo Pacini, and Robert Cobb. I would certainly put Sambunath Day's picture into this pantheon of heroes. But I must also remind you, because we are in the midst now of a public health crisis, Tom Cock writes this in his 2013 article. He says, when we make the hero a solitary figure, we forget the cooperative nature of medicine and public health. There are no solitary heroes in the struggle with endemic and pandemic disease, just the many who struggle to take down and understand their nature. In my search for papers connected with SND, I came across with the help of Dr. Sarkar. Uh, many sorts of letters, and uh, Dr. Sen and Dr. Sarkar, many letters. Here is one. Day's response to a letter from a very prominent cholera researcher at that time, Fan Henningen, at Oxford. I'm going to read. He says, Henningen had written him a letter May 31st, 1977, which is reproduced in the issue of current science. In response, this is what Day writes. On my side, I, that is Day, was satisfied about the cholera enterotoxin. My disappointment came when I tried to extend the work to its natural conclusion, namely to prepare a preventive cholera toxoid. Dr. Shamal Rao recognized so much of work has gone on in cholera in Kolkata, many attempts to get vaccines. Then he says, this was due to my failure to concentrate the toxin. Then he says, replacement of typical strains of cholera vibrio by the so-called delta of vibrios, which are poor toxin producers, and which I think are mutated forms of vibrio cholera. Then he says, my failure to preserve the toxicity of the toxic genic strains. Workers in developed countries cannot imagine how difficult it is to carry out and continue research work without willing personnel and without equipments in an undergraduate teaching pathology and bacteriology come hospital pathology, bacteriology and histology department in a country like ours. Today, medical commissions will remove the teaching of bacteriology uh, from medical curricula. They have already planned to remove pharmacology. He then says, I retired from service in 1973 at the age of 58, and I'm now running a grocer's shop, namely a clinical diagnostic laboratory at my residence. I have taken it as a hobby, which keeps me fit and fairly busy. I have at least this consolation that I'm giving some service to the public, 
switching over to an applied branch of my broad subject of pathology. One cannot but feel extraordinarily sad one, when one reads this letter of 1977. Following this correspondence with Van Henninger, Day was invited to Stockholm to the 1978 Nobel Symposium on Cholera and Related Diarrheas. And the text of his address is reproduced in this issue of current science. I'm going to read you only a little bit of it uh, on the next slide. But this is really the unedited text of Day's talk in that symposium. The original text, which was found with Day's papers, contains markings indicating several possible deletions. He refers to figures and tables, but they were presumably on slides and are not available. In reviewing this symposium, Finkelstein and Bozeman Finkelstein in Nature in 1978 wrote this. They said, I have simply expanded this, and you may ask, why have I done this? This is because when I produced this issue of current science, I thought I was doing something wonderful by putting those boxes and shading them gray because at that time, printing technology had, uh, this was the fashion. Now I find that if you shade it gray, you can't anymore read it after some time. Participants were reminded of how far we have come in a short time by one of the Indian investigators, S.N. Day of Calcutta, who in the late 1950s first showed that the symptoms of cholera could be produced in laboratory models by self-free products of the cholera vibrio. If there are any students listening to my presentation, you must remember to demonstrate all the properties of the cholera vibrio in a self-free culture filtrate is a remarkable uh, finding. If you go back in history, you will find that it is Eduard Buchner's demonstration of self-free fermentation by yeast extracts, which is the starting point of biochemistry. In the Nobel Symposium talk in August 1978, this is what they said. He said, Chairman and friends, before I conclude, I wish to make a few personal remarks. I have been dead since the early 1960s. I have been exhumed by the Nobel Symposium Committee. And these two days with you make me feel that I'm coming to life again. They must have come back to Calcutta in 1978. Other people must have known of the fact that he attended the Nobel Symposium and gave, had been asked to give this talk. Yet, between 1978 and 1985, when he died on the 15th of April, nobody still recognized Day, not even in Kolkata. It was only his friends, Amitabha Sen, and J.K. Sattha, who were probably still in correspondence with him. They write, Sen and Sarkar write this in 1990. He died on the 15th of April, 1985. A few hours before his death, when he was in a state of coma, a letter arrived from S. Arunachalam, editor, Indian Journal of Technology. Arunachalam is one of the earliest persons in India to talk about Eugene Garfield's work and the field of scientific and what Arunachalam had requested was this. He requested Day to get in touch with Eugene Garfield, editor of Current Contents, who was interested to know his biodata and professional contributions. Day could not be informed of this. Garfield's article appeared in 1986, and I've already shown you Garfield's article. He produced it in the 1990 issue of Current Time, 30 years ago. But still, they, of course, never saw that article because he was dead. What did I feel in 1990 after I had read all of this about Day and produced that issue? After I had produced that issue, the only thing that it reminded me was, and I'd looked at other Indian scientists also. I have mentioned their names here. M.K. Subramanyam, M.J. Tirumalachar, G.N. Ramachandran. Some of them recognized to some extent, others totally unknown. I was only reminded of a poem that I had read when I was in school 
This is Thomas Gray's famous elegy written in a country churchyard. I will read the verses which remain in my mind. What Gray said was this. He said, let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys and destiny obscure. No grandeur here with a disdainful smile, the short and simple annals of the poor. Today, when scientists clean about this, their citations and their rich indices, one really wonders about the scientists who went before them, who had done such wonderful work. The next paragraph, the next stanza in Gray's poem applies to all of them. Full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air. Many scientists of the 1950s and 60s, some I have illustrated, have done wonderful work. Their work is largely unknown, except to others who have worked in the same field. And I think many of them are like the gems which lie at the bottom of the ocean. Nobody finds them. Or the flowers which might occasionally bloom in the desert, but nobody is there to see them. SN Day was certainly a gem. It was certainly a wonderful flower of Indian science. In asking me to give this lecture, you have really jogged my memory because I had actually put this issue out of my mind because I produced this very long time ago, spent two years of my life really obsessing about Sambunath Day. In later years, people have borrowed, taken paragraphs from many of the articles in this issue without ever mentioning where they got them from. But that, I think, itself is a tribute to Sambunath Day. Finally, in conclusion, I must thank the two institutions where I have spent the last so many years over 40 years at the Indian Institute of Science, in the last few years in my post-retirement phase at the National Center for Biological Sciences, of having provided me a place where I can read, think, write what I like, and also prepare for lectures such as this. Thank you very much. Dr. Roy, sir, your comments, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, I don't know. First of all, I thank uh, Professor Balaram for this wonderful thing. And his research on Samunadde. Uh, actually, he worked, as he mentioned, that he worked almost two years uh, for all these correspondences, et cetera, and, and uh, publishing an issue of current science on Shambhunath Day. And also he discussed about many other Indian scientists, uh, their contribution, and some of them got recognition, some of them did not uh, got any recognition. So uh, he uh, ended up, ended with the, with the poem from Thomas Gray, and uh, basically, the, the fragrance of, uh, of the poem that is coming out of it, that let everybody will be doing their work, scientists will be doing their work. And uh, probably they don't care much about whether, whether they're getting recognition or not, but their contribution will be recognized someday uh, by, the, by the successor and future generation to come. Way Somunath Day was discovered by, by Professor Balaram, probably the other scientists, those who had really contributed in Indian science. He mentioned about uh, MK Subramaniam, about the East chromosome, and 
MJ uh, Tirachumalam about the antibiotics myco uh, mycology, the discovery of amycin. He also discussed about GNR, GN Ramachandran, the triple helix structure of collagen and collagen protein structure. So these are kind of so many outstanding contribution this Indian scientist did. So uh, I think I thank Professor uh, Baloram once again for this wonderful uh, talk and how much research he did on Famunabde, it is truly extraordinary. With this, I stop here. I uh, pass it on to the organizer, Professor Bhattacharya. So on behalf of my institute and myself, I'm immensely thankful to both of you, sir, Dr. Roy and Dr. Balaram. It's a fantastic talk. I started this oration just out of my emotional expression. When I came across Dr. Day in a newspaper, I felt so sad because where Dr. Day used to stay, I used to pass by that area every day towards my, on my way to my medical college. And in 1984-85, I was very much in Calcutta. I thought that had I have known Dr. Day is alive, I could have met him at least to touch his feet. So this oration was started as a token of respect to show, uh, to be shown to Dr. Day and as an expression of my emotion. Um, but today that uh, emotion is reignited after listening to Dr. Balaram. Um, it is also a lesson for me uh, I believe it's a lesson for a lot of other, others who have listened to Dr. Balaram, how to be dedicated on a cause, to find out uh, about a person, find facts about him, to place facts about facts in the right perspective so that the future generation can know. I have taken quotations from uh, this particular issue of the journal earlier, and I knew that Dr. Balaram was going to talk um, this issue, I didn't say a single word about the. I am sure that Dr. De's son, Shamul Babu, Mr. Shamul De, has been listening to this uh, deliberation today, and he must be very happy. And um, every time he comes and um, he thanks me for this particular oration, I feel it would be, we'll be doing justice to Professor De and also to Professor Balaram if we place our endeavor a little bit more objectively towards the society through serving our duties in, in uh, culture of science in its true, true perspective. So with that note, I thank um, Dr. Roy once again, and I profusely thank Professor Balaram, sir. We are really indebted to you. And um, I do not know I'll be keeping in touch with you the idea of um, uh, this um, igniting um, um, innovations and um, uh, scientific culture uh, has to be inculcated in a much uh, wider way in this country. Because even today we have heroes, perhaps we do not know about them. They are silently working. This is not fair. Those who actually do their best for the country, for the mankind without any interest, they must be given the right position. It is all everyone's responsibility. So with this small note, I want to end and I thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Okay. And I thank all the audience for listening to this wonderful oration and joining Palmocon. Next week, we'll come with a different issue altogether. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir, Talib on the Guru Yamda, Sir, Darun Hoche, Dr. Rai. Okay. Okay. I'm going to get you in the middle of the day. I'm going to get you in the middle of the day. I'm going to get you in the middle of the day. I'm going to get you in the middle of the day. I'm going to get you in the middle of the day. I'm going to get you in the middle of the day. 